So we'll begin this morning with um, personal sharing from our ISCC coordinator. And now she has worked tirelessly to bring training programs to devotees. Please welcome to the stage Sister Ashika Maharaj. Thank you for the opportunity to share with you an aspect of my life that transformed me forever. Firstly, let me take you back in time. It is the year 1997 and three young university students and friends are sitting discussing religion. In doing so, one friend mentions that there is an individual in India called Sai Baba who claims to be God. The other two friends, being believers of Jesus, reacted quite severely and used all their limited knowledge to put down such audacity. Now how many of you think I was the friend introducing Swami? <laughs> well, you're actually correct. I was actually the other friend who ruthlessly put Swami down in 1997. Ladies and gentlemen, Sai brothers and sisters, I was not born in a Sai fold. At the age of 22, I was a mainstream youth, devoid of any understanding on the purpose of life. However, I prayed religiously every night since the age of eight. In my prayers, I talked to an unseen and misunderstood God. It is this discipline that I believe built within me faith and confidence that I have today. The year 1999 is a very special year in my life's journey. I was not in a good space with my parents and having just returned, Living a relatively free student life from university, home was a task. So it was a welcome relief when one day, another friend called me. She was then sent by her mother to a conference where some guy called Jagger was giving a talk to youth for three days. Would I like to come, she asked. Of course, was my reaction. I had no idea who this Jay Jagadishan was and what the conference was about, but it was much better than staying at home. And so it is Waitangi Weekend. The conference is to start on Saturday and we were out partying till very late on Friday. I walked in fashionably late, wearing bright silver pants and chewing gum. There were close to a hundred youth present, and as I walked in, I noticed a difference in the atmosphere. Then, a man wearing white appeared, who silently commanded the attention of those present. Aha! Uh -huh. So this was Uncle Jagger. As clear as day, I remember the first question he asked. Are you happy? Are you happy? Well, no one had asked me that question before. As I reflect on that day, I realize that this question was my initiation to a life beyond confusion, beyond mundane existence, and an initiation into higher truth. That weekend in 1999, I became a true student. I learned things these ears did not know they yearned to hear. From the most inspirational songs to the most profound teachings, I discovered my innate spirit, and I cannot describe the immense energy that took over me. Every cell in my being vibrated. The more I learned about Sai, the more I fell in love with him. After the conference, when I reached home, I declared that I was vegetarian and God walked earth. My auntie who lived with us 
almost fainted, and my cousin thought I had gone for good, to say the least. But my parents listened, and the more I explained in class track, the more they understood. Later, my mother told me something very special. She said, Ashika, as you drove away to attend the conference, I prayed to the Lord. I prayed that you would find what you were looking for. Dear all, a parent's prayer from the heart has immense power. And I found in that one weekend the answer to my nightly prayers that began at eight. A pathway to true happiness. Needless to say, 17 years on, my family and I have not looked back. And within this time, I have had some amazing mentors and role models. However, Uncle Jada, you were the instrument that worked size magic into my life. I certainly would not be here today as a happily married wife and mother of three children if it were not for you. And it is very special to me that I can thank you in this manner so many years on. Associate Professor and an academic, uh, serving in many countries, in universities, in UK, Sri Lanka, Netherlands, in Palmerston, in New Zealand. And two years ago, he wrote a book. It was called The Spirituality and Sustainable Development, which was published by Macmillan's and became an International Book Awards finalist. And I was very surprised. Soon after that, he published a book called Spirituality Demystified and has won a prestigious New Zealand award by the Ashton Wiley, the top award. And the public, this is what the, the panel had to say about his book. This book is mind-blowing in its simplicity, its clarity, its ability to cover the most abstract of topics seamlessly while staying fully grounded, completely clear and coherent. Its contents are timely indeed. They are of our time and solely needed in our perturbed and chaotic modern world. And then summed up so beautifully by the head of the Ashton Valley Trust by saying, if one were to read only one book in one's lifetime. This is the one. Please welcome Rohana. Om Sai Ram. Thank you, Brother Ravi, for uh, giving me this opportunity to share with you the content of the book I recently published. 
spirituality be mystified. In fact, I wrote this book not for people like you who have faith in Swami, faith in God, and faith in scriptures. I wrote this book for those who have faith only in science in order to help them to understand God and spirituality in scientific terms. In this book, I am not going to make any reference to Swami's teachings or, or scriptures, only to scientific books and dictionaries. Now, <clears throat> the, what is spirit in scientific terms? According to the dictionary definitions, spirit means that we use life to a system. A yes, system means all biological systems, including ourselves. And spirit is the entity which gives life to those uh, living systems. Once spirit is withdrawn, these all living systems become dead systems. Then, uh, if, if, if spirit is the source of life, or of, if it is the life itself, it must be deathless, it must be immortal. Then, if we are to understand what spirit is in rational terms, perhaps the best way is to look into ourselves, into, the, into this uh, system, living system, through a powerful microscope in order to find out whether there is any deathless entity within us. If we do so, uh, we will discover that as the building block of our uh, body, the system is all atoms. And according to quantum physics, 99.999% of each and every atom is empty. And this emptiness is filled by energy. Energy is, according to physics, it, is, it has neither birth nor death. It is eternal, it is deathless, it is immortal. Now you can conclude that spirit is energy and energy is spirit. This energy fills the whole universe according to quantum physics. And also, though it fills the whole universe, it is one entity. They have, they, many scientists describe this, describe this as, as an indivisible and inseparable field of energy. This energy is also conscious. It, can, it is aware. It can think. And some scientists say it can, they can, it can, the energy can even make choices like us. It is totally alive. And some scientists call it, and call it the universal mind. Thing is that, uh, since it is conscious, and since it, is, uh, since it fills the whole universe, scientists call it universal consciousness. From the perspective of the universal consciousness, we all are its parts. It is like the ten fingers of my body. If any finger is hurt, I am hurt. In the same way, from the perspective of universal consciousness, we all are its parts. And therefore, the universal consciousness wants all of us to be happy, to be healthy, and to be prosperous, and to be joyous, and it is love. Its love is unconditional, and it is unlimited. This universal consciousness exists everywhere in, in the universe. Therefore, it is omnipresent. And also, since it is conscious, since it exists everywhere, it knows everything. It is all-knowing. And also, it is love. And where love is, we know there is peace. And there is happiness and joy. And everything what we need is there. The, the view that universal consciousness is peace, is love, and is uh, happiness is supported by research studies in uh, near-death experience. What happens at death is that we leave the physical body and we merge with the universal consciousness. There are some people who have temporarily left their body 
and merge with universal consciousness and again they have come back to the body. Their experiences are called near-death experiences. Those who have had near-death experiences have described the happiness that they experienced during that period, the joyous that they experienced, the peace that they experienced and some have described that they did not even want to come back to their physical body. It was so, so, so happy. The feelings were so happy and so peaceful. And this is in this this in this in uh, 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 universal consciousness is called by various names by various scientists, and some call it the higher self and infinite self and also ultimate truth. And I think it is what Swami calls constant integrated awareness. And in many religions it is called God. Then uh, this is spirit. What is spirituality in rational terms? According to dictionary definitions, spirituality is the state of being one with spirit. So currently we are in the state of one with body because we identify ourselves with the body. Then spirituality implies inner transformation from the state of being one with body or matter to the spirit of being one with so sorry, the state of being one with uh, uh, spirit or uh, energy. It is a sort of uh, inner transformation. This can also be called becoming who we really are. Because according to quantum physics, 99.999% of what we call I is energy. Then becoming spiritual means becoming who we really are, becoming energy. Matter is only 0.00001. Though we call our body it is I. That means being spiritual is becoming who we really are. Then, <coughs> according to uh, recent findings in uh, quantum physics and neuros neuroscience, we are already uh, spiritual. And uh, it was uh, some time ago. Until, until some time ago, many brain scientists believed that brain uh, was producing uh, what we call uh, consciousness. There were reasons for them to believe so. That was because mainly when brain is damaged, we become unconscious. And once brain is healed, we become consciousness. Then they thought, ah, it is the brain which produces consciousness. But now they are beginning to uh, realize that the relationship between brain and the consciousness is quite uh, comparable to the relationship between a television set and, and, and the uh, images that, that, it, that it shows on its screen. When television set, television set receives signals from outside and it converts signals into images and so images on its screen. When TV is broken, it cannot receive images, then there won't be any images on it. Once it is repaired, it begins to receive signals, then again we can see images on the screen. But that does not mean that television set produces images. It receives signals from outside and then show images on it. In the same way, our brain does not produce consciousness, but it receives consciousness from the universal consciousness, from the spirit, and makes us conscious. And <coughs> if it is the case, our, our brain is the representative of the universal consciousness, or representative of the spirit. If it is the case, our brain must have the qualities of the universal consciousness, such as oneness, that love, that peace. In fact, it is the case. Now, there are evidence to prove that our brain, all these, all these higher qualities, the universal love, is hardwired in, the, in our brain. Now, we think we are, we are all our separate entities, but from our brain's perspective, we all are connected. Now, scientists have found that uh, uh, brains communicate with uh, other brains. 
that, that, uh, then uh, one of the good uh, examples is uh, uh, telepathy, uh, telepathy. And we can also find evidence from our day to day life. Now suppose when we are, while we are driving, we, we, we stop uh, in front of our traffic lights. And while waiting for the green light, we relax and look around. Sometimes we look into the people in, in other vehicles. If you, if you keep on staring at a person in, in another vehicle, all of a sudden that person turns his head and looks at you. Then you get caught and feel embarrassed. You may, th you may think that, uh, how did that fellow get to know that I was watching him? The reason is that your brain sends the message to the other person's brain saying that, hey look, this, this fellow is watching you. In that way we are all uh, uh, connected. And also, quite recently, a group of uh, neuroscientists in Italy have discovered a strange uh, kind of uh, new neurons. Our ordinary neurons help us enable us to uh, feel and experience pain and pleasure taking place in, in our brain, in our body. But they have discovered a, another kind of neurons which enable us to uh, experience the pain and pleasure taking place in, some, in, in uh, other people. They call it uh, mirror neurons. And it is these mirror neurons which help us to experience people's pain in any uh, other, other people's pain. When we, we see somebody suffering, then we experience the same pain within our body. So that means, though we think we are separated, at the level of brain, we are interconnected. And also, uh, a new scientist in the USA published a book about seven years, seven years ago. His name was uh, 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 Donald Puff. And in his book, he pointed out, with the help of uh, heaps of uh, scientific evidence, that what we call golden rule, which is now we heard from Brother Jagabat Gurb, golden rule, which is the foundation of all religions, and it is hardwired in our brain. And same author, this, uh, have published a book only last year, his title is Altruistic Brain. In this book, he argues that altruism is hardwired in our brain. And he says that uh, 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 love, in other words, love all and serve all. This teaching is hardwired in our brain. And naturally, we want to love, we want to love all and serve all. Now the question is, if these things, these qualities are hardwired in our brain, why don't we demonstrate such qualities in our daily life when we interact with other people? The answer comes from a neuroscience. Until recently, neuro, about, until about 20 years ago, neuroscientists believed that uh, uh, neural connections or neural connections of our brain are fixed and they cannot be changed. But now they, are, they, have, they know it was wrong and all neural connections, so what neuroscientists call uh, neural circuits, are not fixed and they keep on changing throughout our life. In this case, this our brain is uh, brain function is quite comparable to the function of a uh, of a uh, film roll of a conventional camera. When you focus camera on a certain object, the image of the object is transferred through the camera into the uh, film roll, and it is recorded on the on the film roll. Uh, uh, in the, in the same way, when we experience with the external world through our senses, what we experience are transferred into the brain and are recorded on the brain in the form of neural connections, in the form of neural circuits. But this neural circuits, well, this is what we call memory. Then we, now when we are listening to Brother Jega, our new neural is, uh, connections are being built up in our brain. But if, if you forget them, they all change. What happens is, uh, our old memories are replaced by new memories. Then, what happens is it, in our life is that when we experience with the external world, 
uh, we find certain things are certain things as pleasurable and some experiences are unpleasurable. Then we like unpleasurable experiences and dislike unpleasurable experiences. All these likes and dislikes get get recorded in the brain in the form of neural neural connections. Then we have we each and every person has a unique set of likes and dislikes. So then we want to somehow fill our uh, like get our get what we like. Then it will be become selfish. This selfishness, the, this selfishness is we call it soft wire. It is not hard wire. That alpha alpha system and older rule are hard wire. But these things are our soft wire. Then this hard wire uh, altruistic brain is overridden by the soft wire our self selfish brain soft soft wire brain. And that's the reason why these hardware qualities cannot guide us from within. Uh, the, the, the good news is that these are all a soft software and therefore it can be changed. The old religions are different pathways to uh, rewire our brain. If we want, uh, we can rewire, uh, rewire our brain. All spiritual practices what to call the bhakti yoga, karma yoga and uh, path of wisdom and all these, all these pathways uh, of all religions are different te techniques to rewire our day. Thank you very much. I left a physical body on the day I completed this book. Uh, Brother Rona would like to gift his book to Brother Jagat, so if you would please come and receive it. And the library has publications, has got a few of his books, so I would advise you to get it as quickly as possible. They're not very expensive. This is the best value for money. <laughs>